Good morning and welcome everyone. Thank you for attending our first Women's Leadership Committee Lunch and Learn. My name is Kelly Hottenstein and I'm the co-chair of the Women's Leadership Committee. The Women's Leadership Committee designs initiatives that successfully develop, empower, and influence women in the greater Susquehanna Valley. This committee also hosts the Chamber's annual Women's Leadership Symposium, which invites women from throughout the Valley to spend a day with highly experienced professionals. The conference gives attendees dozens of new ideas and action plans to boost their career, their attitude, and their life. It is specially designed to give powerful information and profound insights that will make a lasting positive impact on the attendees' lives. I would like to invite all of you to join our committee. We meet the fourth Tuesday of the month. If this is something that you would be interested in, we would love to have you. You, if you could please send me an email, I will make sure you get the information. Check the chat for my email address. Today, we'll, we will be learning about women leaders in our valley who started a business or who helped others start a business during this global pandemic. We will also be introducing you to Julie Hagenbuch from Stories on Tap and, and featuring a Made in the Valley moment with Edna Reinard, Disaster Program Manager for the American Red Cross. We hope you have a ton of questions for our speakers. We will have a Q&A session around 12.45 p.m. So please send your questions in the group chat throughout the event so we can discuss it at that time. Last but not least, at the end of the event, we'll be giving away a $50 gift card that was graciously donated by our sponsor, Isabella's Restaurant. Again, Isabella's Restaurant, downtown Sealands Grove. Isn't this a beautiful glass? Beautiful restaurant, fabulous people, fabulous staff, fabulous food. And this glass goes well with everything. And this is apple juice, just in case you were wondering. Please join me in welcoming today's event sponsor, Stacy and Domenico Napoli of Isabella's in downtown Sealands Grove. Stacey and Domenico, you're on mute. <laughs> you good now? All right, good morning. Thank you, Kelly, for the introduction. Really appreciate that. And uh, thank you for having us for this event this morning. We're very proud to be able to be a sponsor for this event and uh, helping the community in every way possible. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. I'm Stacy and Domenico, my husband. We're here at Isabella's. We're having some technical issues here, so please forgive us. We'd like to take an opportunity to thank you. Um, we're honored that uh, the chamber had asked us and to be sponsorship here for the women's leadership. I was honored to be on the women's leadership board as well. We had a great time planning this event, and you know we're surrounded by lots of women in our family, so we definitely support women's leadership. And we're just very happy to be here and support the chamber and very good to us in our community. Thank you. Hello. Hi, can everybody hear me okay? Can I get a, a thumbs up if you can hear me? Great. So hi, everyone. I'm Julie Hagenbuch. I'm the director of the local organization Stories on Tap. I'm so excited to be here today. I just want to first of all, thank the Chamber of Commerce for this opportunity to be a part of today's Lunch and Learn and to Vanessa Vinos for coordinating it. So a little bit about Stories on Tap. Stories on Tap is a storytelling organization here in the Susquehanna Valley. We are actually celebrating our 10 year anniversary this year. Um, in non-pandemic times, we have live stand-up storytelling events in which audience members are invited to share true stories from their lives on stage. The events are usually focused on a theme, um, and it's basically a way for the community to come together and get to know each other in a new way and in a fun way. So during the pandemic, we've obviously had to change things up a bit because of all the closures. Um, and social distancing. So during the pandemic, we've been doing a lot of workshops. We've been leading workshops with community groups. 
both group workshops and one on one workshops and we are we are available to do those if anybody is interested has a group or would like to work with me individually those are on a sliding scale we think that you know storytelling and telling our stories as a community is super important and everybody deserves the opportunity to do that um, you can find more about stories on tap at stories on tap.org so another thing we've been doing for the past year is uh, local podcasting, collecting and airing the community's pandemic stories um, and what people have been through, um, you know, business owners, mothers, um, basically we've all had our own stories. And so we're collecting those stories and we're airing them via podcast form. So I was lucky enough to work with some of our speakers today. We had a workshop together last week uh, in which we shared our stories um, and they are all doing incredible work here for our communities. So without further ado, I am very excited to hear their stories. Um, and yeah, thank you all of you for all the incredible work you're doing. Thank you, Julie. Hi, my name is Olivia Zellers. Um, I'm from Keystone Human Services and also a member of the Women's Leadership Committee. I'd like to once again thank our sponsor, Isabella's. And just to let you know that every Saturday they have a piano man from 5 to 9 p.m. So make sure to go check them out. Now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Kathy Vitovich. Mm -hmm. Kathy is the leader of the Shimokan Area Business for Economic Revitalization, also known as SABER. She is, has helped 13 businesses, which is phenomenal, open in Shimokan in 2020. Um, so without further ado, Kathy, we'd love to hear your story. Thank you. Um, I didn't help all those businesses, but I'm helping Shimokan revitalize. So um, I'll take that. <laughs> um, I'd like to just say thank you for having me today. I think this is uh, wonderful to have women get together and really, as was stated before, just help each other. Um, and in these times and how are you tired of hearing that already but it's the re, it's our reality so um what i'd like to do is just talk about what is happening in shimokin and um it, it is a renaissance um story and um i'm just glad to be part of it so um i have a slideshow because i like pictures you don't want to just look at me so um i'm just going to go through the slideshow here as we uh, work through the story so um, just a little bit about me, you know, uh, Kathy Vitovich, as she said, I'm president of Sabre. I own my own uh, consulting firm and I also own Heritage Restaurant and a couple other buildings in Shimokan that you'll see as we go through. So where do I begin? What, what do you do when you know your town? And, and this is kind of a sad beginning because I never knew the reality of a burden before this and I would wake up in the middle of the night and just think Lord what can I do to help my town because as many of you know Shimokan was not doing well five ten years ago um, we were pretty dead and and again I'd, I'd wake up and think okay we're full of light we're full of drugs we're full of everything but life what do you do what as a person do you do and so what I decided to do was buy a building because isn't that normal? So I bought this building and it's four storefronts and it's a neat building. It's got three apartments on top and, but it was a tanning salon and there was not good stuff going on in, in that tanning salon. It was like a 24 seven thing and kind of, ugh. and then the other uh, storefronts were all empty. And that is again, reflective of Shimokin. We have a lot of empty storefronts. So I said, all right, I'm gonna take these four storefronts and make it pretty because that's what I like doing. So I took that store, that, that series of storefronts and I made that one pretty. And as I was painting the outside uh, windows around there, I kept looking down at this other building and this other building, gosh, it was even worse shaped than this one. But I said, Lord, I can make that place pretty. I know I can. So. Lo and behold, uh, about, I don't know, a month or so later, I saw a for sale sign on it. So I said, okay, that day I called the realtor and I said, let me go through it. Now you have to understand this building on the outside looks good. 
compared to what the inside looks like. So we go through and we're, we're going through the first floor and I'm looking up at this tin ceiling, but I really had to focus on what I was stepping on because I was literally crunching on all of the paint chips that were coming off that ceiling. It had been empty for 15 years, I think it was. It had been um, literally unused and, and with a guy from South Carolina that bought it off the internet for 13 years. So there was a lot of problems. Um, but what I saw was that tin ceiling. And then I went up to the second floor and I saw another tin ceiling. I'm like, two tin ceilings? Let's do this. Now, of course, my husband noticed the steel beams and you know all those structural things that made it good. And it had a good roof. And that's very important for those that do any kind of revitalization. So you know, after playing hide and seek in the, in the third floor and stuff, my husband and I literally walked down, said to the realtor, we'll take it. This is our offer. And we walked outside and said, what have we done? So the first five people that I told I purchased this building to, and now you kind of figure the first five people I'm talking to are my friends, right? Every one of the five said, are you going to tear it down? And I said, no, tin ceilings, things like that. And what we did do was we made it into Heritage Restaurant. And Heritage is now a place to go. Um, it's, it's got all kinds of artifacts inside. There are um, old chandeliers from our beloved Victoria Theater. There are um, pieces to the old Fun Shop building. For those of you who know uh, Shimokin, Fun Shop was this little Hallmark store and everybody loved the Fun Shop and it burned down three years ago now. So I took the, the pile of bricks that was the Fun Shop that were laying there for months and I went over and I got a truckload of brick and I took them back to Heritage parking lot in the back there and I got a mason and I said, I want a fake brick wall on this one wall. And he said, fabulous, grind off the brick and I'll be happy to make you a wall. So I ended up, and a friend, ended up grinding uh, the mortar off of 400 plus brick because that's what you do when you want a cool uh, brick wall. So again, we made Heritage Restaurant. We have, because of COVID, we did um, enhance it with an outdoor patio. So that parking lot that we had is now an outdoor patio. And as you can see in that slideshow, we have old signs from different elements, different storefronts that were once in place in Shimokan. So again, using that heritage that we have to really decorate. And the inside is gorgeous as well. Um, we kept the tin ceilings, of course, in both the first and the second floor. Um, just brought in, again, all kinds of elements. You can see that fun shop wall at the end of the, the bar there in the, the bottom center. So, you know, just two bars. We have the coal hole bar. It's just fun. It probably cost me a life savings, but, you know, it's tithing. Now, Heritage is a catalyst. It's uh, Andy Twigger, who's going to open two hotels in Chimoke. And I said to him the one time, what made you reinvest now? Here we are, he's been gone for 20 years. I had been kind of out of the scene for 20 plus years. Andy, what made you invest now? And what he said to me was it was this building because we were inherited at the time. He said he would drive past and he'd look at that picture that you saw first and say, if anybody invests in that, it's time to reinvest in my hometown. I did, he did. And now we have this renaissance, this revitalization. So you never just stop at two, right? So I bought a third building and it was right across. I'm standing on the second floor of Heritage and look over at this building. I'm like, gosh, that's another ugly building. I could do something with that. And so we did. And it, there's now a black awning on this one. I don't have a recent picture. You know, it's like a kid. Once you once they grow up a little bit, you don't take as many pictures. Um, but just a really smooth look now to that tired, worn building that was there. So what happens when you start seeing these buildings being revitalized, being renovated? All of a sudden, the lady two doors down from this was out painting her porch. And people are noticing and they're appreciating. And we still have problems, but. So I said, why stop at three? 
again, this one came up. You know, when I tell this story, it's almost like I think I'm crazy, but it's cool. So went across town this time because the other three were kind of visible from each other. So this building was uh, a hoarder's paradise. They had stuff in here that you couldn't even walk through. But again, a gorgeous building, tired inside and out. And as we went through this building, I was out in the hallway and there was this board and it had flowered green and orange paper. And I started just playing with this thing right in here and this gold came up and I said, what's under there? And I took off the contact paper and this was displayed. And this is what you always hope for, right? You hope for some gem that is hidden that you can still salvage. So luckily they used contact paper instead of paint there, but we found this gem and we're gonna put a little logo right inside here. But you can see here, this is all the different uh, groups, lodges for the International Order of the Odd Fellows, IOOF. Here's all the different lodges that were utilizing this space back in the day. And the, it's used, like the one lodge would use it, the first Tuesday of the month, the second one with the first Wednesday of the month, the third one, the third Thursday of the month. This AM, s and I don't even know what this is, Lodge 1199, they met the first Wednesday after the 10th at 1 a.m. Sorry, I'm out by then. But again, it was a hidden gem. So what are we doing with this one? Well, we're going to take this space. And the first day that I saw that second floor that has all these little niches, these different rooms, my mind went to Artisan Alley. Artisan Alley is a new destination for Shimokin. And I don't know if you know, but we're known for coal and mills. We're not known for art, but now we're going to be known for art. Artisan Alley will use all of these little niches for different artists so that they can share their works because they don't have that opportunity much today, um, but they're gonna share their works. And they're, then we're going to partner with local wineries, distilleries, breweries, artisanal coffee, and provide a, a, a haven um, and a workplace and a, a sales place for all of these artists and for the people of Shimokin and surrounding communities to really come in and enjoy that art and, and that social gathering, et cetera. So again, you take what you have, this tired room, and you say, I can do something with that. With some paint, I stripped off the, the uh, uh, stuff on the walls and exposed that awesome brick walls. I had some um, stained glass donated to me. See those? lights up there, they're, they are so cool. Going down that whole alley, if you will. Do you know I had to get 108 light bulbs? You know how expensive LED light bulbs are? Not cool, but anyway, we did it. So that's the second floor. The third floor is yet to be enhanced, but this is gonna be Artisan Lodge. And Artisan Lodge will be this great event space for the artists to, again, just celebrate and to enjoy and to socialize after this long year and so. Um, so that's what we're working on now is Artisan Lodge and it's almost done paint, being painted, but it's just got embellishments on the ceiling. And I think the, the um, walls are 18 foot high and it's got a balcony and an altar and sure. Right in the middle of doing a couple of the other buildings, we had another opportunity present. There was a church in Shimokin that um, the, the diocese was told that there was structural damage. And I'm sure all of you know, churches don't have the largest congregations anymore. So they were down to about 15 people in the congregation. And the diocese said, we can't support any structural improvements. So they were going to tear the church down. And we said, nah, we'll take it we'll take on the structural considerations or, or whatever. And we took it on and we created Bamsey Coffee Shop. And oh, by the way, no structural issues. We're good, solid, uh, 27 inch thick walls. So Bamsey is now this coffee shop, a dog friendly coffee shop. It's awesome. The dogs come in there, the dogs enjoy it more than the people, honest to God. 
So the dogs will, will are allowed to come in and they just hang and, and we have used books and we have little hooks for the dog. So you don't have to hold your dog, just hook them up to the little hook that we have and enjoy. And again, destinations, understanding this city that has been so forlorn now has some destinations. Along with FAMSI, we also took the social hall that was on the other side and because of heritage, because of the artifacts in heritage, people keep saying, hey, Kath, do you want? And I say, yes. So I get donated a lot of different artifacts, historical items, and I created a museum <laughs> in the social hall of Bamsey. And we have a replica of the old silk mill clock. We have WISL studio recreated the actual equipment from our beloved uh, radio station is in there. My husband actually has a secondhand uh, uh, record and CD shop in there. It's like Bamsey Mall. Um, you shouldn't stop, right? Everybody wants to keep going. So I kept going. This is our newest project. Um, this is an independent street. It has not started yet. I just bought this at a tax sale last year. The gentleman who had this before me had used this main street, our downtown area. He used this location to store all of his supplies. So there's stacks of drywall in there, which is handy right now. Um, but like insulation and things like that. And this is the kind of welcoming that I get in, in these buildings that I buy. You know, it's not, it's not the pretty that you see at the end. And, and again, anyone who's gone through re revitalization is just probably sitting there shaking their head. Yep, that's what you get. Um, but you know, this will be an apartment. Um, I'm hoping for an ice cream shop and an old fashioned candy store in that building. I won't run it. I don't run these things, I hope, and, and they present. So that's what I'm hoping for this year. If it turns into something else, fabulous, but that's the hope. So is it all about me? Absolutely not. It is about a team. It is about maybe an inspiration. You know, I consider myself a catalyst, um, but there are so many good things happening in our community. And one of the things that um, I, ponder is that when I was talking to another nearby community, um, there were some students from Bucknell actually helping with this community uh, in a project that they had. And they called me and they said, we hear good things about Shemokin, we'd like to talk to you, you know, what's going on. So they said, um, how did you get everybody involved? I'm like, no, 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 wait, I thought your community had involvement. Like I kind of patterned some of what I did as Saber and go Shemokin and those kinds of things off of what your community did. Why are you asking me? The response was telling. In their community, there are four or five people doing it all. Like they're organizing things, they're making them happen, whatever. Four or five people in a community probably the size of Shemokin. With Shemokin, my biggest problem when we had our Christmas event in November, I had too much help. There is this groundswell of support of people wanting to make a difference in their community. And, and we're just saying, come on, come on, join us, be part of this. And it's, it's individuals, it's organizations, it's LLCs starting. Um, it, it's just amazing. Now, again, do we have our blight still? Yes. Do we have drug problems? Oh my gosh, there was a guy running down the street with, with a knife the other day. Yes, we understand that. What we're doing is not ignoring that, but not letting that stop us either. We're taking it one step at a time. We're making the difference that we can make in all of these areas. Like for instance, the curbstone market that you see at the, the almost the bottom of the uh, right-hand side. We had a farmer's market. It was down to three farmers. Now, back in the 70s, 80s, even 90s, we had dozens of farmers that came every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. It was awesome. You went down there, you got your food. We're down to three. So I was looking at the ordinances from 1917 or something like that, and the ordinance is called the curbstone market. Well, let's do that. It's so much better than a farmer's market. 
So we're going to have curbstone market. We're going to extend it beyond just farmers, and we're going to allow um, crafters there or anything you want to sell. Um, we're going to invite again, wineries, distilleries, and breweries in, and, and you can carry this stuff away. So we're gonna expand that and just let it grow and let it develop over the next couple of years. So we have that kind of stuff going on. We have Shimokan Community Gardens. This was the attempt two years ago at a community garden. You kind of just shake your head, right? Yay, we can plant stuff. And, and they, again, the effort was there. I don't wanna dismiss that but gosh, we can do better. And now this is what our community gardens, not in that same space, of course, but in other space. And they have plans for that. In fact, where those white boxes are now, the white boxes are taken out and there is a, a backhoe in there leveling it off for another garden there. That's what we have going on. We also have Step Up Shemokin. Step Up Shemokin was, is a campaign over the decades, people have said, you should fix those steps. Somebody should fix those steps. The city should fix the step. Well, the city doesn't have money, right? They're, they can't do anything. They, they don't have that opportunity. We've tried for grants. We've done what we can. So instead of just saying somebody, we said let's. And we have this campaign and we call it Step Up Shemokin because we want Shemokin to uh, step up to fix their own steps. What we have done is we've taken those gorgeous WPC, WPA steps that were built in the 30s, and we have people, we have individuals from Shimokin cleaning the steps, prepping the steps, and we said everybody can um, sponsor a step. We now have over $20,000 from people from Shimokin, from businesses, whatever, sponsoring the steps, and we uh, received a grant from the Degenstein Foundation for $1,000 a step. They, they provided us with $99,000 from one of their foundations. So this right here, last Tuesday, the steps are now being taken down and they're going to be totally renovated. Now, do I think that there's going to be a groundswell of people running up and down those steps and using them like, like they used to when Schroyer's had thousands of people and the mill had thousands of people working there and kids walked back and forth to school. They don't even do that anymore. Um, no, I don't think the utilization is going to be there. What this is all about to me is community pride. All of a sudden, they've been saying for decades, now we're doing, we're making it happen. That's what we're all about. That community pride is so important to any community. We had the fun zone, this yellow and green striped building, and there's graffiti on the windows and there was garbage inside. And we finally caught up to the owner and said, please let us fix this. Let us help you. Now the fun zone, that yellow sign is going down soon. The fun zone is now gray. Now it's more attractive to our downtown and a potential investor for that building owner. The cool thing about this, not only the fact that that yellow is gone, thank goodness, but when I was out of town, when they were painting that building, they had people walk by and say, hey, need help? And community folks stopped and spent the next couple of hours helping paint. That's community pride. That's community involvement. We have scaffolding. We, this is another one of my buildings that we're renovating that outside. Again, it had been tired. There's the scaffolding, and we see that all over Shemokin. We have Covered Bridge Brew House. This just happened last Saturday night. These are people that are either from Shemokin or outside Shemokin who are no longer afraid to ride or drive in Shemokin because you get killed there. You don't, well, okay, some people do, but not any more than anybody else, just saying. So how are we doing? We have 12 new businesses. It's, it is actually 13 now that opened during COVID. I had two of them, right? And, and I was involved with a couple others, but things are happening outside of me. Covered Bridge Brew House is known throughout the region as this destination. That was the party that I just said. Another new brewery just opened. Um, we have an event every month, whether it's a, a downtown Christmas thing and that Covered Bridge, they have an event every month too. That's even outside of the ones I'm talking about. 
Ours are larger. This weekend, anybody want anything to do, come on into Shemokin. We have the Anthracite Heritage Festival from 10 to 5. And there are 90 some vendors there that and, and lots of good ethnic food. Um, so we have all these things going on. The AOAA, the Anthracite Outdoor Adventure Area, can allow ATVs or off-road vehicles, OHVs, to ride right into town. So I'm at Heritage Restaurant. The portal for the ATVs coming in town is right at Bamsey, and they just ride their ATVs down our main street, no problem. Follow the rules, follow the laws, and they, there's a, a certain... Uh, fence that they stay in out of the uh, neighborhoods and things like that. They can ride their ATVs right through town and they're less noisy than a Harley. We've tested it. We have two hotels coming in. So this is all the stuff that started from this dead town 10 years ago. <coughs> so how are we doing? This is us, baby. There's coal under there. What's happening is that coal is lighting the fire for the Phoenix. We have a Go Shemokin uh, plan that we're working with a five-year strategic plan. This is one of the streetscapes that he gave as uh, an idea. Can you imagine this in Shemokin? Come on, bring it. I'm good. But that allows that art that I talked about to really be involved in that as well. So now about that beginning slide. When I said, Lord, Shemokin is dead. My hometown is dead. What we did is we revitalization, revitalizing Shemokin one ugly building at a time or making a difference one person at a time. That's where we are. And I know I went over, Vanessa gave me the, the uh, okay. Um, now we're right back on track. So whomever's next, thank you all for your uh, attention, <laughs> hopefully. And uh, I hope you enjoy that. Thank you. Kathy, thank you so much for that. It sounds like you're doing wonderful things for Shemokin. That's super exciting. Thank you. Um, congr congratulations on your endeavors with that. Um, hello, everyone. I am Chanel. I am with Nature's Medicines in Sealand's Grove. I just wanted to thank Stacy. I stopped this morning and got my lovely glass. I can't wait to use it. Maybe I'll come down and try out one of those new cocktails, and my husband can maybe try a wine. That'd be nice. Uh, next up, we are going to have Emily Mrosko Gorski. I think I may have butchered that a little bit. I hope not. Too bad, Emily. She founded Dig Furniture Bank. They are located in Lewisburg. It was established in 2020, and it's for furniture and household goods for local families that may have limited income. So, Emily, if you're ready to go ahead, it's all you. Thank you, Chanel. And yeah, that's a it's a tough uh, last name lineup. You actually, I just have to give you a whole virtual hug. I am just from Dig Furniture uh, Deliveries uh, to Shimokin, and every time we go, we're like finding more and more reasons to make it a whole day event. We just oh. are so impressed, and I'm so happy to like meet the person behind it all and the group and. Uh, I'm just so inspired. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you, Emily. Very, very cool. <laughs> so um, yeah, my, my name is Emily Gorski and I am the founder of Dig Furniture Bank. Uh, we are actually celebrating our first year uh, this weekend. We're doing our virtual uh, weekend of festivities, starting with a uh, upcycled furniture auction online and then doing a live event to talk a little bit more about who we are, hear from people that have been helped by us on Saturday night. Um, so uh, we're pretty new to the area. Uh, we were founded in Lewisburg, but we actually now live in Mifflinburg. We just moved about a month Go and um, what's really first of all, Mifflinburg is my hometown. Second of all, we're involved with a group very similar to um, the mission and vision of what Kathy's doing with Shemokin, who this group is really looking to revitalize Mifflinburg. And so, um, you know, we are honored to be the first business the nonprofit um, to partner with Mifflinburg Innovation Works in our new space. So. Um, a little bit about 
well, me, I guess. Um, and I told Vanessa, I don't have a PowerPoint. I'm just kind of winging it here. Uh, but I, again, I grew up in Mifflinburg. I, um, when I was very young, probably uh, uh, about around three, my parents got a divorce. And during the divorce, um, it was my mom, especially who was raising, we found that, you know, we were in need of a lot of community support. And so when we were young and my parents split, my mom found herself in a position where she came from the house for us to, to make it a growing up environment. So with the help of our neighbors, uh, we were given things like a couch, a TV, a dining room table. And during that time where things were really strange and we for me and my dad wasn't here anymore you know he lived three hours away we're still really close and us in our home that made us feel my, me and my brother like everything was normal and we were like every other kid you know that we would come go over and play with at their home so the fact that we had this furniture in the time when we didn't for a little bit um it really made me feel normal in a time of a lot of uncertainty and of course, I didn't realize at the age of three how much of an impact that would have on me, but um, how much of an impact it did have on me. And growing up, I always loved the concept of home, and I just have always been so inspired by creating my really feel good about the, the, place, the space you live in. So fast forward many years later. I uh, went to, out to Portland, Oregon, and I lived out there for five years where I got my nonprofit, uh, my start in my nonprofit career, and I worked at a family homeless shelter out there, and part of our partners, one of our partners was a furniture bank called Community Warehouse, and when families would move out of shelter into their new homes with the help of where I worked, they would get their entire homes from couches and beds to silverware and plates, all given to them from community warehouse and they were all gently used donations and so it was kind of that moment where me growing up in this kind of scarce environment through you know my parents own um my family's own kind of crisis um to that moment it all just kind of came together for me and it was just a big as oprah would say an aha moment that something like this exists this this concept of a furniture bank. So at that point, I just knew that I had to start a furniture bank one day. Um, and so that was, you know, five years plus another three. Um, I moved back to my hometown area. My husband and I now live in Lewisburg and we bought a wonderful house about two years ago in, in Lewisburg, just outside of town. And it just felt like all the stars aligned. I was in a good place with my career. We had the place we bought has this big barn in the back of our house and it was sitting empty for so long. And in my in my previous job at Community Action Agency in Sealands Grove, I was seeing the same thing I saw in Portland and the same thing I saw growing up where families would move into housing from all different kinds of scenarios and they wouldn't have anything to move in with, let alone any expendable income to fill their homes. So there were a lot of families where we were kind of shuffling around CAA and other local nonprofits kind of working together like, hey, do you have a set of pots and pans for this family? Or hey, do you, this, this family, they have a young child and they need a bed. Do you have any like connections with beds? And so I had this dream in my head and I said, you know what, let's just go ahead and take the leap and start collecting some furniture. So we did, um, and it really, it's really quickly grown. So we were in our, our space, which was a fairly small shed, now that I look at it, um, for a year. Um, and then we were donated this space in Mifflinburg, which is about four times the space. So we're really at this, at this jumping off point where we can do so much more and welcome in so many more volunteers. So um, it's feeling really good. I have my First AmeriCorps member, Gabby, sitting here with me. Hi, Gabby. <laughs> I didn't tell her I would do that, but this is, you know, we're finally to a point where it's not only just my brain, I have another full-time um, helper with me. And um, it's, it's really an exciting time. So, you know, at the root of it, what we do is we collect that gently used furniture and household items. So just like community warehouse, anything from 
silverware, plates, cups, pots and pans to couches, dining room tables, dressers. Um, we can't do used mattresses quite yet. We're in the process of applying for a spray license so that we can start reusing some gently used mattresses. And then also um, large appliances we're not quite doing, but when folks do need beds, we do have a good night sleep fund set up where people can donate and 100% of their donation will go towards the purchase of a brand new bed for family. For a family, so um, oftentimes, um, I think we've purchased 63 new beds since we started, um, just truly through community um, donation. I just got a note that my connection is unstable, so I hope you can still hear me. <laughs> um, so that's really who, who we are. We have a lot of big dreams in the future. Um, we're hoping we're doing some really fun partnerships that are just starting with um, some local furniture um, stores and design stores where we want to, you know, really just instill that dignity to people through household goods and by building a space that they're really proud to live in and have family over in and, and grow in. So that's who we are. Honored to be here with everybody else. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. I don't know about all of you, but I am absolutely in awe about the great things that these ladies are doing. Um, it's it's amazing, and uh, you know, I, I I kudos to you all. Um, it's, it's great work, and I'm sure it's very tiring, but you are dedicated, and you are all amazing. So I wish you continued success. Next, we will hear from our Made in the Valley moment. After that, we will be hearing from Nicole Will of the Two Owls and Amber Amado de Guerrero of Bucknell SBBC. Following that, we will have our Q&A and the prize giveaway will conclude the event. I don't know about you, I love this glass and I love Isabella's and I'm thinking this apple juice may soon be time to go and it might be time to head down to have a Venetian split, Venetian spritz, which was one of Isabella's uh, signature drinks. Did you know that Isabella's is the only one in the area that offers sommelier, 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 I can't say that word very well, but it's services that you can enjoy. Um, they'll help you pick the perfect wine with your dining experience. Stop in and check it out. So next on our agenda is uh, Edna Reinard. She's with the Disaster Program Manager for the American Red Cross. Edna? Edna, you're on mute. might be having some difficulties here. Looks like she's, right? Nope, she's still. Can you unmute your phone, Edna? Come on, everybody's thinking it. It's a disaster, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Looks like you're unmuted now, Edna. We're still having some difficulty here. It, it, how about now? Um, it's a little better. Okay, it keeps telling me. Um, I first of all, I want to apologize for my background. I'm on my way to a vaccination clinic, and um, I got five feet in it, so I pulled over at a semi. Yeah. Well, 
Edna, your connection is very bad on our end. Is anyone else hearing her? It's just me. Oh, you're hearing her? Well, Okay, I think we're going to, um, Edna, I apologize, we can't hear you. So um, if you have gotten a chance to um, relocate from where you are now and you have better connection, we will move on. Um, we'll try to add you onto this later, but um, Kathy, I'm gonna put you on the spot right now. That's okay, thank you. Thank you, Edna, for trying. We hope that you get to a place where there's a little bit more transmission of the technology. We've all kind of endured that over these last 15 months. Um, my name is Kathy Venius, and I'm the Administrative Assistant for the Bucknell Humanities Center. And I have the privilege of sharing this lovely glass that is shareable. It's so large, it holds a lot of stuff. And of course, I'm a whip queen green. So um, this is generously donated to us by Isabella's Restaurant, our sponsor. And I also have the privilege of introducing Nicole Will from Two Owls in Milton, right on Broadway. She has the most amazing cinnamon buns there. Um, Nicole opened the Two Owls grocery store in downtown Milton in 2020. Uh, the Two Owls sells locally grown and made products as well as quality natural products. And so Nicole, would you like to take it away? Thank you, Kathy. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, first of all, wow, I'm so impressed with the panelists and what everyone's doing. Uh, just who we've heard so far, Kathy and Emily, it's incredible to hear about your projects um, and really how, uh, you know, you work every day to revitalize the area. And um, I just want to say thank you to Vanessa and Julie, um, who hosted the uh, help helping me to come up with what to say for this. That was really actually very helpful. I have like all my notes right here. I'm just going to wing it. Um, and thank you to all the other panelists and thank you so much to Isabella's who is sponsoring. Um, so last year, the same time, like May, I was actually really happy <laughs> that COVID had struck. And I know that does, that sounds so selfish, but, um, uh, in a way, I had uh, I had come from New York City, and and was living in Milton. I still live in Milton, Pennsylvania, um, and I was working in the art world in New York City. And I was traveling back and forth. Um, basically, every month I would go for a week to the city, and I would help clients with their contemporary art collections. And as like kind of cool as it sounds, it was a lot. It was like a lot of travel and it was stressful. And um, when COVID hit, I was, I was grateful not to be in the city. Um, and I was happy that I was living out in central Pennsylvania and I could go outside and I almost felt like it was a blessing that my life had led me here. And very shortly, uh, like a couple months later, um, I was like, okay, I've watched enough Netflix. <laughs> I'm, I'm so ready for something else. And, you know, when it, when I think about like, uh, you know, what, what pro, I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just a business person, but I, by heart or by nature, but I was like, what problem could I potentially solve just where we are in this community? And, um, uh, you know, one thing that we don't have, which I was so used to, uh, in New York was a local convenient, uh, store to buy food, um, to buy treats or ice cream. I, I always had my, my bodega in Chinatown was called the Don Juan Deli. And, um, I would go and get my pint of ice cream and, uh, you know, cheese if I needed cheese or eggs or whatever. Um, and 
really what I saw was, you know, in downtown Milton, um, we have a few solid businesses, Frank's, who's the barber, we've got Lisa's Milltown Deli, um, we've got the custom care pharmacy, uh, but there's a room for a lot of other business. Um, there's quite a few for rent signs or vacancies. And, um, and, you know, I really, what Kathy was saying really has struck true for me. It's like, how can I bring, or how can my, me and my boyfriend who opened this store bring something beautiful to the town of Milton? And, um, you know, I, I love quotes and I was thinking, you know, of that famous Helena Bonham Carter quote, uh, everything in life is art, what you do, how you dress, the way you love and how you talk. And I think how and what you eat and cook. And um, I love organic foods. I like vegan foods, but I also love meat and cheese. I love fresh bread um, and you know, I, I thought that, you know, one thing that would really bring something very valuable to this town would be an accumulation of all of these things in one place. Um, and what better to do, how better to do that, but to support the local makers in the community and specifically the region. And as we think about it, like the state of Pennsylvania, because I think that, you know, there's so many wonderful farms and cheese makers and artisans, but we're pretty spread out, you know? And like, we have, uh, we have a business that we work with who makes pierogies that's based in Shimokin. You know, we work with Wild for Salmon. They're based in Bloomsburg. Um, we have people from Mifflinburg, Gable House Bakes uh, that we work with. And so, you know, if we can kind of centralize a place where the where those uh, iced cinnamon buns, Kathy, are from Gable House in Mifflinburg, um, if we have a place where we can centralize some of the best products of the region, um, we hope that we can bring, you know, what we've found our customers want the most, which is the best quality at a fair price, but somewhere where also your dollar goes back to supporting other businesses in the area. So it's kind of a twofer. And, you know, that's really been the feedback that we've gotten mostly from our customers is that, you know, when they come in, they can find sometimes candles, sometimes flowers, sometimes cheese, sometimes cold brew coffee, you know, the, this is coffee, not beer. And it's from uh, uh, Sawhorse Cafe in Williamsport. Um, they just started bottling and doing these as a grocery item. Um, and you can find all of these things and, and what, you're, what you're walking out of the store with actually most of what you spent goes back to these different smaller businesses in our community. Um, this used to be a place called Red Lancers. Um, and for like, <laughs> like since the sixties, it was miniature like military figurines. But when we found the space, um, it hadn't been open to the public for many years. And uh, we painted the facade um, we, uh, the, the landlord, the person who bought the building, renovated the apartments above, renovated this space for us, and also sees a vision of, you know, bringing uh, something, I hate, I keep saying the word valuable, but keep bringing something exciting to the town of Milton and, you know, really liked our idea because he could see that it would help or connect to the people he was renting to. Um, but, you know, I've seen, we've seen just since opening in September, September 25th of 2020 is when we opened, um, new and vigorous excitement in Milton. There's a couple new businesses that are just opening up. 
Uh, Terry shop is on the corner in this beautiful old Victorian. Um, they're doing a renovation and they're going to open bookshop and performance space. There's also Sinful Treats, which is doing um, some sugary baked goods. Uh, so, you know, and then I think I heard, this is like rumors, but across the street, I think they're going to do, somebody just rented it, maybe a yoga studio. I don't know. I'm into it. I can do yoga all day. Um, and not that I have time. <laughs> um, and yeah, so, you know, we believe, I, I bought the house that I live in in Milton. Like, I believe that there's so much good here and it's so beautiful and the river's right here and, and I love it. And I think we have so much potential and, um, and I'm really excited to see how things grow. So one of the initiatives that we're doing, just since I have a captive audience, is every day now we're going to sample the goods of you know our vendors so you can come in and you can taste the difference of being able to support small businesses that are localized and regional and also the quality that you get from that from from not necessarily buying from a from a big box store that's been you know carrying the goods in a warehouse for months and months so we really think that people are going to see the difference and taste the difference and um and you know raising it's the it was Tewksbury Grace Leah said this and I really like it she said uh rising tide raises all boats and I feel like if we can do that in some way then it's it's a good day um and then the last thing I'll mention is that you know we really see that the that our customer our core customer is really wanting another um, option for food, prepared foods. So currently in this messy back area that you can see, we are building a kitchen. Um, we have bought our range and we have our hood being delivered <laughs> next week. So we're planning on doing mostly prepared foods, some vegan options, but also proteins focusing on healthy but delicious and um, really trying to provide as much to the community and our customer as we can. Um, I have so many more notes here, but I feel like I said enough. So I'm looking forward to anybody who has questions and thanks again for inviting me to be on this panel. Hi everyone, my name is Kendi Alvarez and I am part of the Women's Leadership Symposium um, Committee. So excited for today. Um, if you haven't noticed a trend, I think that this next speaker is going to like bring it all full circle. Um, <laughs> don't make that face, I see you. Um, Way to put some pressure on me, Kendi, I appreciate that. <laughs> setting the bar high so that they know what to expect. So um, if you haven't already heard about this phenomenal woman in the Valley, um, she has had multiple businesses that she has been involved in. Um, if you have not had her tacos, you have missed out on the amazingness that they are. Um, but Amber Amado de Guerrero is a phenom in the Valley. She is um, someone who understands the full cycle of what has happened for someone's business because she's lived that experience and has now taken that into being a consultant with the Small Business Development Center at Bucknell. Um, and so she is <laughs> really going to be the kind of person who takes all of the things that we've heard so far about the things that people are doing and kind of like touching on all of that because of her personal lived experience, but then also what it is that she's doing now. So um, helping us to blaze trails um, and looking to the future. Without further ado, Amber. 
Oh my goodness, Kendi, that was quite the introduction. I'm not sure I deserved all that, but I certainly appreciate it. Um, you know, we've heard a lot about reinvention. I'll give a shout out to Kendi. Talk about reinventing herself as she ran for mayor and, you know, are you mayor elect? Kind of, sort of, we're super excited for you and thanks for the warm welcome. Um, I also have to say, right as that introduction was happening, all my computer screens went black and I was like, oh gosh, I'm not gonna have my notes. They're back again, but we, we're all in this world. It's been so much change and technical difficulties and we're all zoomed out, but I'm so thrilled to be here with everyone. And, and I guess, I hope that I have a chance, you know, as listening to some of the other speakers and I thought, I wonder if I took the wrong approach when I was thinking about what I wanted to, to talk with everyone about today. Um, but I do think that it comes a little bit full circle because I've heard a lot about a lot about strife and a lot about opportunity and a lot about people wanting and needing something better. And I think that the pandemic has been so challenging in so many ways, but hopefully it's bringing us back around and it's a, it's a new beginning. I, I choose to think about it that way. So at the SBDC, we provide one-on-one -on -one consulting with businesses. Um, it's private, it's confidential, and, and we do it in many different ways. We help develop financial projections and we can help with marketing strategies. And we're doing a lot of work right now about supporting businesses who need to come up to speed with social media in this new virtual post-pandemic world. Um, and we've helped 25 businesses start since October. And seven of those have been women-owned businesses. And, you know, it just, it takes so much courage to start a business at any time, but particularly during a pandemic, it is, um, it's just a world we haven't seen before. And I really have a lot of admiration for everyone who has taken that risk and stepped out. Um, as Kendi mentioned, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not, um, I know a little bit about entrepreneurship. I had, you know, prior to joining the SBDC, I had a catering business for a number of years. And so I know a lot about the highs and lows of what that um, entrepreneurial journey looks like. And, you know, one of my highest highs and lowest lows in my own personal business was, gosh, it was a very warm August Thursday about three years ago. And I had just finished doing um, the last delivery of the day. It was about 11 p.m. And we had done, uh, we had catered for 1,200 people that day. And that was huge for my business. Like I wasn't even sure that I wanted to take on that event. It was epic. I mean, we did this 600 person lunch service and 400 people at dinner and a late night delivery for the third shift. And in the background of all of that, we had also done these swanky hors d'oeuvres for a group that was getting together on the Hiawatha Riverboat. Now, why would I do that on top of a 1200 person event? Because it was booked ahead of time. And, you know, like Kathy was saying, you just, that's just what you do. You get it done when you're in business. And I think that as, as women, that's what we do in general, right? We all juggle a lot. We've got so many responsibilities. We, we put other things first and we put our heads down and we, we get through it. Now, the reason, the reason that that day was also the lowest low in my business career is because my husband had to drive me to that delivery. I called him because I had been literally, I had worked 40 hours straight to make that event happen. I was like delirious. I, I called him. I was like, I don't feel safe to drive. Like you have to come. <laughs> You're going to have to come and help me. And the reason that that happened is because I'd finally replaced my full-time cook. We'd rehired the position. That was awesome. Getting him up to speed. He'd been there about a month and he was out sick with the flu the three days prior to that event. So all, of the, all the college kids were gone. They'd already gone back to school. I had no cook. I had a tremendous amount of organization to do. And it was just like, I was just, I was so exhausted. I was so burnt out at that moment. And, and it wasn't, I wish that had been isolated, but like that was so much of what happened throughout. Number one, it was a really physical business, but you know, I did so much planning and a lot of coordination. And I was always like, how do I grow? And the business needs to grow and the business needs this. And, and, and I never really stopped to think about how I, as an individual fit into that scenario, right? And don't you think that, and I, I guess I'm making a generalization, but I think that as women, I don't think that I'm alone in putting myself behind a lot of other priorities. And so one of the things that I brought with me, in addition to, you know, exiting a business, largely because of burnout and for, you know, for numerous other reasons, it wasn't a bad decision. It was a good decision. 
But one of the things that I brought with me when I came to the SBDC was, and I remember talking about this during the interview process, um, how do we strike that balance? And you know, making sure that as we're, we're talking to businesses and we're doing that teaching, that we're also talking about self-care because I think that we don't speak to those elements of business very often. We talk about financial projections, but we don't talk about how it fits into our lives. And so I, I've, I've had the privilege of working with a number of businesses this year. And, and I'm going to choose to focus on the women-owned businesses that I really felt that that theme of burnout was something that was woven through all of their stories. Um, but the other part is that all of these women are so incredible and they have these, these commitments to something better. Um, so one example, a woman and her husband started a business, you know, a number of years ago and really trying to foster a sense of community, um, some return to values and having a really strong dedication to environmental initiatives and, and responsible stewardship of the land. And they did a lot of in-person events. And when the pandemic hit, um, everything stopped, you know, and then they reached this point where, where do we go from here? And when she, I, I actually knew this person and, and then they were working with the Bucknell, um, one of our classes that did a website project. And I reached out to, you know, to talk to them a little bit about marketing. And one of the things that she talked about was, you know, there was burnout and there was a need to do something better, but also she felt it was really a time that she wanted to focus on doing something for herself and finding something that created fulfillment, that fostered her creativity, that allowed her to be passionate, but not burdened. And so, you know, we spend time talking about, you know, how many hours a week, like when I work with somebody on a marketing strategy, one of the questions that I always ask is how many hours a week do you want to dedicate to this? Like, I'm not going to tell you, you need to do five hours. If you tell me, look, I've got an hour, then let's make a plan for an hour. If you want to put 20 hours a week into a business and it's a side hustle, then don't plan 20 hours of programming, plan 10 and give yourself that breathing space. Um, but it's really exciting because she's, you know, she's developing this curriculum for families and, and mothers um, in response to the homeschooling that had been thrust upon many women during the pandemic and, and you know, taking her own experience and being able to share that and foster community and bring people closer together. And she's developing some other education around, around land stewardship, about sequestering carbon and how each of us can individually take small steps to fight climate change. And it's really exciting. And, and it's exciting to see her doing that in a way where she's honoring her own needs and, and putting her own needs out in front. Um, another similar business, homeschooling mom, um, she was, has been homeschooling for years. And not that she was overwhelmed for, by the pandemic, but what she saw was a lot of overwhelm with other parents and women. And she also noticed that there were a lot of mental health struggles with children from being just sort of the effects of not being able to be in school, not being around their friends. And, you know, I didn't have little children at home when the pandemic happened, but it was still you know, it, it was still had challenges socially for us as well. So, I mean, I think that was just so compounded for, for children and parents and, you know, and she saw this difficulty and decided to, you know, turn it into an opportunity to create again, like that sense of wanting to have community and wanting something better. And she's running these, these fantastic nature workshops where, you know, kids are going out into the woods and they're building huts and they're making boats and having races in the creek and they're learning about the environment and they're doing all these cool things but then they're also getting out in nature and they're having that connection that so many of us have I think lost in this virtual world we don't have as much connection to you know to the environment and the world around us um, you know and again we sat down and talked about what's your goal for this you know it doesn't have to be a multi-million dollar venture. Like you're, it's okay for you to have whatever goal feels right to you. And, and I think that's another thing to make sure that we're, that we're looking at ourselves and our businesses and analyzing them and valuing them within our own context and not comparing ourselves to others and not feeling like we need to be or do something beyond what makes sense for us. You know, and again, we, you know, we ran financial projections and we also talked about time, you know, because she is still a parent and she does still homeschool and how does this incorporate into a family life and, and not take over? Because one of the things that we do is 
at the SBDC, you know, our role is to help businesses start, grow, and also prosper. And I really think that um, balance and self-care is a large part of a business being able to be prosperous. So I guess, you know, I just wanted to, just wanted to put a shout out of encouragement to, you know, everyone who started a business in general, um, you know, kudos to you. If you've done it in the last year, you are a superstar. Um, you know, I, I have so much respect for your courage and, you know, I just, uh, I hope that everyone takes this moment to, you know, reflect on all the community that's happening and we've been so isolated for the last year. I'm really looking forward to seeing what the next year brings as people start to reconnect, as new businesses open, as people see the opportunities and, um, and get together and just a reminder for everyone to, you know, go out there and, and be courageous and, and also take care of yourself in the process. Thank you so much, Amber. Kelly, are we kicking it back to you? Uh, no, it's Kay's turn. Oh. Thank you again, Amber. My name is Kay Ike. I work at CETACOG and I am a member of the Women's Leadership Committee. And I am enjoying my grape raspberry sparkling ice. And it's really cold too. Um, that Stacy from Isabella has given me. Thank you so much. Did you know that, is it, uh, have you seen Isabella's newly added renovations? That they have a mezzanine for adding dining space. Also every Thursday in June, Isabella's is touring the regions of Italy for Italian summer nights. And thank you again, Isabellis, for being a sponsor of today's event. Karen Good um, from State, Karen Good State Farm Agency when, was unable to attend today. However, if you would like to learn more about her business, which she opened in 2020 in Shemokin Dam, you can click on the link that will be provided in the chat box. So now I have the pleasure of introducing a special lady, Vanessa Venius. Vanessa is the Director of Communications for the Greater Susquehanna Valley Chamber of Commerce, and she will be leading the question and answer portion of the event. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Kay. Hello, everybody. First of all, a big round of applause for all of our speakers today with jazz hands, round of applause. Um, I just wanna, you know, I, I really appreciate all of our uh, speakers being here today. Um, you know, it, it really is, as Kendi had said when she was introducing Amber, I feel like what we've learned um, from everyone was really full circle, um, starting with Kathy Vitovich and Shimokin, who has a vision for a community at large. Um, you know, and what you said about revitalizing one building at a time or making a difference one person at a time. I think we can all agree that you've made a difference in, in our lives today and our perception for, for the city of Shemokin. Um, and, you know, you get to work with, uh, you know, other community leaders, uh, you know, like Emily uh, Marusco, who, um, you know, is who founded an organization that focuses on helping families in the Valley um, get their feet on the ground and, and grow here and be prosperous in the Valley. So, uh, and then Nicole Will, um, you know, you're a small business owner thinking of other small business owners, supporting them at your, uh, at the two owls um, as a, a neighbor <laughs> from you and a couple of blocks away from the two owls. I, I really appreciate all you're doing for the community of Milton and, um, you know, being an anchor for people to want to come and uh, start other businesses and to live downtown. Um, and then again, full circle with Amber, I'm glad that we have um, leaders like you and the rest of the uh, staff at Bucknell SBDC for helping 
you know, people with a vision get their business started. Um, so yeah, again, round of applause to all you guys. And uh, of course, thank you again to Isabella's. I too have a uh, an apple cider, thanks to uh, Kelly, who's in the conference room right around the corner. <laughs> Um, Kelly and Jenny Wentz, she's our executive director of workforce. Uh, she's here as well. We had a little surprise uh, when the Zoom started. Um, Isabella's delivered us some lunch. So uh, Stacy and uh, I don't know if you're here, um, but thank you. Thank you very much. It was delicious. Um, so let's see here. Forgive me. I'm, uh, as, as Amber would say, juggling many things at once. I'm trying to do IT in the background and lead this Q&A. Uh, I got a lot of great, we got a lot of great feedback in the chat box. Um, I didn't see many questions come through. So I was thinking if anyone has a question, they can just raise their hand with the uh, reaction emoji or um, raise their hand and, and we can ask our presenters some questions. Oh, Laura. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I think it's muted. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. I just wanted to say thank you. Um, this was wonderful. It was definitely inspirational. Um, I've owned a business for 16 years and started a second business in 2016, and it's been very challenging. So to hear that people are opening new businesses uh, definitely gives me some inspiration. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Laura. Um, hold on, I see a chat coming through here. Oh yeah, everyone's excited to see everyone gathering here. Thank you, Amber. Um, Kelly has a question. Um, Kathy, what is next on your inspiration list for Shemokin? Uh, so I'm a woman, right? So I'm not single tasking. Um, Artisan Alley is opening in uh, hopefully July. We're looking at July. So call out to artists. Uh, Artisan Alley um, is looking for artists right now. Um, we're opening an Airbnb unit uh, next weekend. We're going to start taking reservations um that that tired looking next on the list thing um well i have to finish the museum that we're doing in uh at bamsey and then we'll move to the independent street property but you know it's again i i want to i want to specify like i get it i'm a doer i can't can't stop right but it's not it, it, shimokin must be a woman because it's not a single thread there either right? There are so many things going on at the same time. I have nothing to do with Covered Bridge except going there and, and enjoying. Um, there's the hotel coming in. There's uh, the brewery just opened. So uh, just keep your eye on smoking, baby. We're, we're rising. <laughs> exactly, Kate. <laughs> That's going to be a new t-shirt. Okay, if anyone didn't see, uh, Kate wrote in the chat box, Shemokin must be a woman needs to be put on a t-shirt. <laughs> that is fantastic. Yeah. Do we know, Amber, uh, do we know any uh, t-shirt making businesses? <laughs> oh gosh, you're putting me on the spot. I'm going to put Steve Stumbris on the spot if he's here because he's been around much longer than I have. And I'm sure there's somebody. Steve, who is it? Uh, absolutely. We've got, we've got a few, we've got a few and, and Kathy and everyone will be happy to share. Uh, I know, uh, one person who is kind of busy right now, having welcomed a brand new baby into the world like four days ago. Uh, but, uh, uh Michelle Fetter, uh, owner of Lewistown print works, uh, was a presenter at one of the SBDC's workshops. Mm -hmm. And yes, she does graphic design and screen printing. Um, she's a little busy right now but happy to connect you with her in the, in the near future. We have Kathy. Um, I'm, I can't, I'm just, how do we say your last name? Christian Zingaro. Thank you. <laughs> 
Hi, thank you. I know it's an odd spelling, but it is Christensen Garrell. Um, I don't want to ask an open ended question about um, the panelists, um, if they would respond to their relationship with money as they've grown their businesses. Um, yes, I think I just want to leave it open ended in that way um, and hope to just hear some responses. I have a love hate relationship with money. <laughs> um, so from a funding perspective, I self fund. Um, I don't have the, the requirements that many do. Um, this is my tithing. As I said, I also run a consulting firm and that is a, a national firm. So um, all of my projects are self funded. As a nonprofit, <laughs> money is money. Um, I actually have a finance committee meeting later tonight, so this is a very fitting question, Kathy. Thank you. Um, I am definitely not someone who is comfortable <laughs> managing money. Um, I have a great team of volunteers who are my finance committee that helps with that part. But really what I, I've made a very specific connection or realization with money and starting dig in that, you know, my whole career has been a nonprofit fund, fund, fundraising, but with dig, one of our core values is abundance. And we've also really been focusing on relationship building and it's really helped kind of make money not so scary to me with specifically a nod to fundraising, because it's all about relationship building. And, you know, it's really, it's been fun to fundraise for DIG. And it's really been cool to see the doors that open up with the different funding opportunities that have come through for us. So um, I have, I feel like my relationship with money, I mean, with nonprofits, it's always a little scary, but I feel like it's gotten even stronger and more optimistic than before. Shall I go? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, money's awesome <laughs> when you have it. Um, uh, we we did micro loans. We did small personal micro loans from people who wanted to support our idea, and we we did it all on a shoestring. We paint like literally painted the facade ourselves. We bought anything that was low budget in terms of uh, display. Um, we just, you know, tried to do everything ourselves as much as we can. Um, we found somebody in the community who wanted to see a kitchen here, who support, who's supporting that initiative. Um, you know, I think, you know, it's just so important to network and make sure that what we're doing sounds good to other people. So there's a benefit to asking for money to a certain extent, because, you know, if someone's like, no, that's a bad idea, then you're not going to get that small micro loan either. Um, we're applying to grant for grants um, to help subsidize some of our income uh, as it relates to COVID. Now that things people are getting vaxxed, you know, we're we're, you know, doing drumming up as much um, in store events that we can and participating in any way we can. Um, and locally, you know, supporting like our first Fridays in Milton is not a huge financial commitment, but it does help with marketing for us. So we look at ways we can market in the most efficient and cost effective way. Um, while while still is trying to stay <laughs> above above in the black but you know we, we're also pretty realist in the sense that we're like not even a year old and to think that we're going to make any kind of profit at this point we're we're not quite there yet so i hope that helps i'll just give a quick wrap up based on what nicole said i think that when you're in the beginning you know bootstrapping is a great way to go um you know some amount of avoidance of debt as you're getting started but then also once you establish a revenue stream, having some thought ahead of time of how do you want to spend that and what makes sense and what helps move you forward on your mission um, and what tasks do you start to pay someone else to do and what do you retain yourself? So I think those are the good things to really think about 
like, okay, once I hit this level, what's the first thing I want off my plate and take the one that you hate the most <laughs> that you can outsource that somebody else can do, you know, start to get rid of the things that other people can do for you and hang on to the things that only you can do. Wow, all great answers. This is awesome. And I just, we're, we're, we're almost out of time. It's 1256. Um, I believe Kathy Vitovich has to head out here shortly. Um, if you uh, disappear off my screen, Kathy, thank you again. <laughs> um, I'm gonna try to be quick. Uh, we do have a $50 gift card to Isabella's to give away. Uh, but before we do that, I have some really exciting news to share with everyone on behalf of the Women's Leadership Committee. Uh, let me figure out, do my own screen share here. So we are very excited to announce that our Women's Leadership Symposium is officially scheduled for Tuesday, October 12th. And the theme of this year's symposium is blazing trails, following our passions, improving our futures. And uh, this is going to be a women's leadership symposium experience uh, like we've never had before. We are going to be taking this event downtown in, uh, into downtown Lewisburg. It's going to be, um, and you know, we invite you to experience a community of women who will empower, educate, and lead together. We will be hosting a variety of breakout uh, sessions between the campus theater and a few businesses uh, along Market Street and as well as uh, some interactive experiences you can have along the Bull Run Creek and uh, Picture the Piers and, and it's just going to be a really fun day downtown and uh, for the food we're going to be uh, giving out vouchers to support local um, small business owners uh, in the restaurant industry. So more to come on that. But meanwhile, just save the date, block it off. It's going to be a great time. Um, and thanks to our sponsors. Um, uh, UPMC is our premier sponsor, Geisinger, Evan, Members Choice, uh, Financial Credit Union, Wise, and Service First. Um, and then we also have um, another event that's coming up a little closer. Um, this is our first chamber event that we are hosting in person in well over a year. We're very excited to be able to see all of our members again and get back to in-person networking opportunities. Um, so this is Business on Tap and it's gonna be held at Rusty Real Brewing Company on Thursday, July 8th from 5 to 7 p.m. Um, so there will be more information about that event coming up. And last but not least, again, save the date. This one you do not want to miss. It's our, the chamber is celebrating our uh, centennial year and we're calling it our second century of prosperity. Um, so we're hosting our second century soiree on Saturday, November 6th at area premium, event, premium events inside the shoe factory in Milton. Um, it is going to be a Fabulous uh, once in a century celebration uh, and to kick off the roaring 2020s. Um, and yes, think Gadsby attire. It's going to be great. <laughs> um, so, moving on to our prize wheel, so we can give away this uh, gift card that was very generously donated by Isabella's. Let's go here. All right. We have Larry Nighting. Is there a Larry Nighting present? Is Larry here? Oh, okay. I'm going to actually spin it again. See if we can find someone that's still present here. <gasps> I don't, is Carol Kennedy here? I think I saw it stop on Kate Caller first. She's here, isn't she? <laughs> Where is Kate? There you are. <laughs> I don't want to be spinning the wheel all day. <laughs> that was close enough, right? 
<laughs> Congratulations. Um, and uh, thank you again for everyone coming out. Thank you again to Isabella's. And, um, and we're going to be sending an email out shortly with a survey in that if you could please just take uh, about five minutes out of your out of your day to fill that out, we would really appreciate it. So thank you. Thanks, Thanks <laughs>